about, oh, I, I, I have to apologize. I have some PowerPoint slides, and I have to admit, they are not as entertaining <laughs> as the video you've been watching, but. I'm just press the air out too Okay. Fast. In disclosure, I was not at Woodstock. I was only five uh, <laughs> when it happened. <laughs> so I can't give you any personal stories. Uh, and I'm going to talk about, uh, well, my topic is contemporary labor and employment topics for business. So what, what I'm going to cover, 
is uh, recent developments in state and federal labor and employment law uh, of interest to businesses. Uh, and you're probably wondering, well, how's that tie into Woodstock? And I want to let you know, there, there is that last video you saw, you saw the guys, people building the stage, okay? They were employed by somebody. Uh, and I'm going to tell you, <laughs> and, <laughs> okay, and somebody paid them and somebody hired them. Uh, and uh, if they were to do that today, it would be a totally different world in which they would conduct that. And I, I'm going to, just in the past year, the things that have happened, uh, you know, that would never have happened because it would have taken them six weeks to, to do the paperwork and get them hired and they would have never been able to do it again. So that's never going to happen again. Um, and the first topic I want to talk about is, let me see if I get this right. There we go. Uh, there was just enacted back in uh, December the New York State Wage Theft Pre Prevention Act. And this uh, is one in a series of recent laws uh, over the past year or so enacted by the state uh, because there's this fear, and I think it stems mostly from New York City, that employers are doing all of these bad things and stealing wages by uh, not paying employees properly, not paying overtime, taking illegal deductions, uh, and you, they get these people from the city testifying about all these horrible things and what's left of the garment industry and uh, hotel restaurant industry and so uh, we get these laws and this one is quite uh, involved and burdensome and it went into effect on April 9th uh, and uh, there's several components up here there's uh, new notice requirements when you hire somebody uh, pay statement requirements notices increased penalties upon employers uh, the Commissioner of Labor has increased enforcement powers. Uh, the, the whistleblowers have more protection now, and there are forms from the Department of Labor, if you can believe that, uh, to hand out to employees to cover all of this. So let me start off with uh, the new notice requirements. Uh, as of April 9th now, every employer in the state, whenever you hire someone, uh, you now have to give them a notice uh, at the time of hire, and that means before they start any work, uh, of a written notice that includes the following information, okay? The rate of pay and the basis for it. So if they're making $8 an hour or whatever, you got to tell them that. Uh, whether they're being paid by the hour, the day, the shift, the piece rate, whatever, however that's calculated. Any allowances made for minimum wage if they're in the restaurant hotel industry for things such as uh, meals and lodging allowances. Uh, the regular payday when they're going to get paid. Uh, the name of their employer in case they don't know it after they've accepted the job offer. If you do biz if you use a DBA, you've got to tell them what the DBA is in the notice. You've got to include the physical address of your principal office uh, and, uh, or the mailing address if it's different, the telephone number of the employer, and any other information that the commissioner deems material and necessary down the road, so that, that could change. So uh, you've got to give them this notice before they start any work, so the, the guys you saw constructing, you know, the, the, the stage at Woodstock, I'm sure, didn't get this notice. Uh, they probably didn't know who they were working for, how much they were getting paid, or if they were going to get paid. But now they'd have to get that notice before they start. Uh, and not only do you have to do it upon hire, but you have to give for every new hire, but you have to give that notice to every employee every year sometime between January 1st and February 1st. So you hire a new employee during the year, you bring them on, you've got to give them this notice at the time of hire before you let them do any work. And then you've got a 30-day window from January 1st to February 1st of each year where you have to give this notice out to each and every employee. And there are no exceptions. So it goes all the way up from uh, the janitor to the CEO. And uh, there's no exceptions for pay status, whether they're salaried or hourly. Everybody has to get the notice. Uh, so uh, that should only add about two or three minutes of administrative time. Uh, and then if that's not enough, uh, there's a requirement that the notice has to be given in English and if the employee has identified a primary language other than English as their language, 
you have to provide it to them in that language as well. There is a little exception uh, I get to in a minute. And you have to obtain from the employee a signed and dated written acknowledgement that they received the notice. And you have to keep that for six years. Okay, and, and they also have to affirm that they've identified to you what their primary language is if it's other than English. And I, I'm not quite sure how, you, how they do that, but I guess they have to speak enough English to be able to tell you that. And then if they're eligible for overtime, the notice has to tell them the rate. Uh, the, the good news is that the Department of Labor has produced uh, template notices that you can use uh, for this. So they've made it relatively easy. If you go onto their website, you can find them. And they have about six notices, one for hourly, uh, exempt, uh, commission, piece rate, uh, what have you. And you just use the right notice and you fill in the information and you give it to the employee. Uh, uh, and the nice, the, the one out I noticed, I, I told you about, was if the employee's primary language is other than English, they've translated the forms into, if I've got this right, I think uh, Chinese, Russian, uh, Polish, um, and Korean so far, and they may do a few other languages. But if they don't have the language, if they don't have a form in the language that the employee, uh, and Spanish, if they don't have a form <laughs> in the language of, for the employee, you can just give them the, form, the notice in English, and that'll, that'll count. So uh, the other thing is uh, it's, you, you can produce your own form and use it if you want, but it's probably not a good idea because uh, if you use your own form and there are any mistakes or omissions in it, uh, that'll be a violation and you'll be penalized for it, whereas if you use the state forms, uh, you're insulated, and if there are any mistakes in the state form as far as the pre-printed information, if they've made a mistake, uh, you won't be penalized. So that's nice of them. Uh, so uh, you've got those requirements. Uh, there's also some pay stub requirements, uh, notice requirements, pay statement requirements. Uh, when you give the employee the pay statement, you know, most of us see the paycheck and it's got your name and all that other information. Now they've got a whole list of things that you have to include, uh, just in case you're not. Uh, the dates of work covered by the payment, that's probably been in there. The name of the employee, <laughs> that's a good idea. Uh, the name of the employer, again, in case they've forgotten. The address and telephone number, again. The rates of pay, so a lot of this is the information you've got to give them when you first hire them. You've got to give to them uh, in every pay statement. Um, whether they're eligible for overtime. And then what I like, uh, I don't know, if there aren't too many piece rate uh, facilities anymore, but it still happens. Uh, piece rate. If you use piece rate, you have to give them the statement and you have to tell them exactly how many pieces uh, they produced uh, during the pay period. So you have to give that uh, on every payroll. Um, and uh, also if an employee makes a request to know how his or her wages are completed, um, compu uh, computated, you have to give them that, that information as well upon request. So you have this whole new regulatory scheme uh, of notices for, for pay, uh, which you have to be in compliance with as of uh, April 9th. And if you're not, the Commissioner of Labor is going to uh, come down and do some bad things. They've increased the Commissioner's ability to institute fines. If you don't give the notice upon hire, that's a $50 fine every week up to a maximum of $2,500. Uh, and if you, uh, uh, likewise, you don't provide them with the required wage information for every pay period, that's a $100 fine every week per employee, um, which can go up to a maximum of $2,500. And the nice part about it is that uh, there's now a new provision that allows the employee uh, to sue uh, for these violations and so while they may only get $2,500, there's a nice provision that says they can get their court costs and their attorney's fees. So there's an incentive now for, for lawyers to come after you. And the commissioner also has the ability to get 100% liquidated damages uh, from the employer for failure to comply. So those are quite onerous, uh, something new. And they've also increased the penalties of uh, 10, 000, up to $10,000 in addition to the liquidated damages. Uh, and then another one is uh, uh, some more protections for employees if they complain about their wages under this law. Uh, uh, now an employee is protected, whistleblower protection, 
uh, if they complain, it used to be they would be protected if they only complained to the Attorney General uh, or the Commissioner of Labor. Now they're protected, according to the statute, if they complain to, quote, or any other person, unquote. And that's not defined. So theoretically, that could mean if they complain to their coworker and you happen to overhear it and you take some adverse action against them, they're protected because they complained about their um, wages to some other person. And the, uh, and the nice thing also is they don't actually have to have made a complaint to be protected. If you believe that they've made a complaint for whatever reason, if you think they just aren't, they look at you the wrong way when they look at their pay statement and they look back at you and give you a nasty face or, or something, uh, if the employer simply believes that they've made a complaint and you take action against them, that's illegal. So, and uh, finally, of course, uh, the employee's complaint doesn't have to be a state of violation of the law. It doesn't matter if, they're, if uh, there really is no violation as long as they have a good faith belief that what they're saying, that they're complaining about a violation, if they have that good faith belief, they're protected. And you can't take any adverse action against them. So you have that. And as I said, uh, the Department of Labor has issued those forms and you can go on their website and, and get all of those. Uh, any questions about that enthralling statute? Yeah. Sure. Uh, they did. Uh, they did issue uh, about a month ago a list of frequently asked questions that are on the website, and um, you can't for the wage statements. You can issue those electronically as long as the employee has access to a computer and are able to print them off. Yeah, they made that uh, concession. Okay, so uh, hand in hand with that, uh, just a little before that law was enacted last summer, uh, the. New York State Department of Labor came down with a change of interpretation, there we go, regarding deductions from wages. Uh, there is a particular section in the New York Labor Law 193 that governs deductions from an employee's wages. Uh, and basically what it says is that uh, employers can only take deductions uh, for items such as uh, insurance premiums, pension or health and welfare benefits, contributions to charitable organizations, payment for U.S. bonds, uh, and payments for union dues or assessments, and there was a catch, there's a catch-all provision that says similar benefits, uh, similar payments for the benefit of the employee, which is uh, a nebulous term. Uh, and uh, over the years, the Department of Labor was very lax in enforcing that, and a lot of employers uh, interpreted the phrase similar payments for the benefit of the employee quite broadly, uh, to be anything from uh, you know, tuition assistance, uh, 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 buying equipment, you know, if, uh, safety shoes, uh, glasses, anything like that, uh, anything that ultimately would end up in the employee's hands th for which they could charge them, they would say, well, it's for their benefit, uh, we'll take it out of their pay as long as they sign the authorization. And the Department of Labor for many years did not enforce the uh, provision, the, the statute, very uh, uh, forceful, and they let things go, and they were kind of just accepting of those types of things, uh, and, and so it got quite broad. Uh, but unfortunately, a couple of years ago, the New York State Court of Appeals issued a few decisions um, about deductions from wages, and the Department of Labor decided that those decisions changed the interpretation and application of the statute. So last summer, they issued a couple of opinion letters saying, well, uh, we've changed our mind on what can be deducted and we're not going to restrict it uh, a little more. And uh, what they came down with to say was that uh, what the statute says is really what the statute says. You can only make deductions for health insurance, pension, those enumerated things. Uh, and the phrase similar, similar contributions for the benefit of the employee references back to those items. And so if it's going to be a deduction, it has to be something for the employee's later benefit or for a charitable organization uh, directed by the employee. So what they said was that means that um, you can no longer make deductions from wages for anything other than those items, including uh, what shocked everybody was an overpayment for wages. 
because uh, a lot of times, through, for whatever reason, somebody may get overpaid um, through a payroll error or, or a timesheet error, and you discover it a week later, and you want to recoup it. And so the practice was you simply would recoup it, recoup it from the next pay period if it wasn't, you know, uh, not too large, if it was uh, more than, as long as it wasn't more than 10% of the uh, gross pay of the paycheck, you could do that. And you may have to do, you may have to have done it over weeks. And the Department of Labor said, no, you can no longer recoup overpayments from wages. So if you overpay an employee and you discover it, you can't withhold it from any subsequent paychecks. And so employers said, well, how do we get the money back? And the Department of Labor's answer is, you can go to the employee and you can say, Fred, we overpaid you last week. We'd like you to pay the money back. And oh, by the way, we have to tell you that um, we can't take any discipline against you if you don't pay it back. But we really would like you to pay it back. And if Fred says, I think I'll keep the money, I'm not going to pay it back, you can't do anything to Fred. Uh, the only way you can get your money back is to go to court and sue Fred. Uh, so uh, th that's changed the landscape quite a bit. Uh, and so you can't threaten, you can't coerce uh, anyone into uh, giving that money back. You can only ask that they voluntarily do so. So uh, that's, uh, again, that, that, that goes in line with this trend in the state to protect employees' wages. In the past year, any questions on that? Anybody making illegal deductions from employees? <laughs> and you know that th that includes things like um, uh, cafeterias. I had a couple of clients where you know they have a in-house cafeteria for the employees, and they have you know their their swipe cards, and they would just have the employee you know swipe out, and then they would deduct the meal period, uh, the, the amount of the meal from the employee's pay. Can't do that anymore. Uh, all those little things are, are now verboten. Okay. Uh, I, I think you could, yeah. <laughs> sure. Yeah, you'd get a judgment. I don't. I didn't. I can't see why you wouldn't be able to garnish it. Yeah. Right, and you know, the, the, that reaction is what you know, most employers are saying, you know, it's just not practical, it doesn't make sense. You know, what's wrong with allowing employers to make the uh, deduction as long as you notify the employee and you get their consent in writing, uh, and under the regulations you limited it to 10% of their gross wages so that, you know, you're not, it's not a hardship, you're not taking it all back in a chunk. Uh, but the Department of Labor, and there have been attempts to get the Department of Labor to either change their interpretation or to amend the labor law to allow that, but that hasn't, neither one of those has happened yet. Uh, the next nice new development from the Department of Labor, well, from the, on the labor side, is the uh, uh, Article 25B of the New York Labor Law, the New York State Construction Industry Fair Play Act. So if you see a theme here, uh, this is a continuation. Uh, this is mainly aimed at Contractors, uh, who you know, home contractors, uh, general contractors, who use the services of what they like to call independent contractors. Uh, and there's always a question of, well, are they truly independent contractors? Are they employees? And the reason it's of interest of the state is because if they're employees, uh, the contractors have to withhold income tax, FICA, and everything else. Uh, and keep records of what they've paid them so that they, the state will get their money if they're treated as independent contractors. Uh, you know, then uh, the, uh, contra the employing general contractors don't have to make any reports to the state. They don't have to report anything, make any withholdings, and it's all dependent on the quote-unquote independent contractor to make sure that he or she reports his or her, her full wages uh, at the end of the year, and if they're paid in cash, the chances of that happening are probably slim. So this is primarily a revenue uh, generation uh, statute. And what this requires uh, is that if any person provides services for a contractor in the construction industry, uh, either a contractor or subcontractor, uh, that that person is deemed to be an employee. So the statute says you're an employee unless you can 
meet all of the exceptions and get out from under it. So it's quite onerous. A and to qualify as an independent contractor, uh, there are only 12 items that they have to meet, uh, all of them. Uh, <laughs> so they, uh, to qualify as an independent contractor, they have to, the business has to be performing services free from the direction or control over the means and manner of providing the service. And, and there can only be control over the results. So that's understandable. Uh, you know, if, I, if I'm controlling the way in which you're doing the work, it's generally an employment relationship. Uh, so a truly an independent contractor, you usually simply say, uh, you know, uh, build me this, and this is how I want it to look, this is how big I want it, uh, this is the color, etc. And you leave them alone and they go off and do it. Uh, the sec second exception they have to meet is uh, the business entity uh, is not subject to cancellation or destruction uh, upon cancellation of the business relationship, meaning that, uh, you know, they, if they lose work for this contractor, they have to be, they still have to be a viable ongoing business because otherwise it just shows that they're a, a captive of the contractor. Uh, they have to have a substantial interest investment in the capital of the business. You know, they've got to have some money at stake. Uh, employees usually don't. Uh, the business needs to own the capital goods that they use. Own your own tools. Uh, they have to make their services available to the general public so they just can't do the work for one contractor. I, I you know, built a new house a few years ago and I remember, you know, they had all these sub, these contractors come in and I talked to them and, you know, so who do you do your, what do you do? Well, I, you know, I do cabinetry work or whatever. Who do you work for? I do all my work for this company that's building your house. Okay, it's probably not an independent contractor under this law. Um, okay, the business needs to include services rendered on a federal income tax schedule as an independent contractor or business, so they've got to file uh, tax returns that way. Um, they have to do, perform their business under, an, under a business name. They've got to have something, they just can't be, um, you know, just be hired under their own name. Um, uh, if there's any licenses or permits required, they have to pay for them themselves. And then the, the, the rest. Um, and so, uh, in addition to that, it requires the contractors to post a notice at the work site, which lists uh, the requirements that if they're employees, they're entitled to pay uh, wages, uh, and it also tells them where to go and file a complaint with the Department of Labor if they think they're not being classified properly. Uh, and so the penalties are quite stiff as well, $2,500, $5,000. So again, uh, you know, you get the, the sense, uh, notice to the people doing the work by posting this notice of what qualifies as an employee or independent contractor. If they think they're being discriminated, um, not treated, classified the right way, tells them where they can go make a complaint. And of course, if you take any adverse action against them for making a complaint, you're subject to penalties for retaliating against them. So those are the three major items uh, from the state uh, in the past year. Any questions so far? How am I doing on time? Do fine. Do fine? How much time do I don't want to go over? Uh, you've got another, uh, five, minutes. five minutes? Okay, then I'll get to the, I'll get to the important stuff. Um, <laughs> uh, Same-sex leave policy. Uh, if uh, employers have bereavement leaves uh, that allow a spouse to take leave for the death of their spouse or a spouse's relative, a new law that went into effect in October requires that those same benefits be extended to uh, for an employee who has a committed same-sex partner. So if you have an employee and they have a committed same-sex partner and that person's, um, rel that person or that person's uh, mother or other relative uh, dies, uh, you need to let them take bereavement leave for that uh, in those instances as well. And the same committed same-sex partner is defined as those who are financially and emotionally interdependent in a manner commonly presumed of a spouse. So I think that covers pretty much everything. So uh, you really shouldn't ask any questions. And if anyone comes to you and says, you know, I have a committed same-sex partner and his or her father just died and your bereavement policy allows employees to take off for that, you, you need to let them do that as well. Okay, um, on the federal side, uh, two recent Supreme Court cases of significance. Uh, one is a retaliation claim. The Supreme Court issued this just uh, in January, extended the retaliation protections to third parties. 
Uh, under the federal discrimination laws, uh, certainly employees are protected from retaliation for making a complaint of discrimination either to their employees or to a government agency. And this was a case where uh, a employ female employee and her fiance worked for the same company. The female employee filed a complaint with the EEOC. And when the company got that, they said, and they t probably talked to their lawyer and told them that, well, you can't take any adverse action against the employee for filing the complaint because you'll really be in a bad spot then. And someone probably said, yeah, but her fiance works for us and can we do anything to him? And they had the bright idea of, yeah, let's fire him. So they fired the fiance and the fiance I got a lawyer who filed a, a lawsuit that said I should be protected by the retaliation statutes uh, because they're taking retaliation against her for filing her rights. And so the issue was uh, whether or not a third party uh, who had not filed the charge or made any complaint under the discrimination laws was protected under the retaliation statutes. And the Supreme Court uh, said yes. And they've been very... Uh, uh, receptive to retaliation claims. And their theory was that um, this person, the fian male fiance fell within the zone of interest uh, because uh, the, retail the retaliation statutes are meant to protect employees from retaliation. Uh, and that by, by firing her fiance, they had a chilling effect on her desire to enforce her rights in the workplace. And they said, therefore, uh, he had a right to sue. So. That's a significant expansion of rights to third parties in the workplace. And they also upheld a case um, imposing a cat's paw theory. Uh, this is a situation where you have a supervisor who may be discriminating against an employee, you know, uh, may be making, for, for whatever reason, uh, uh, you know, they may give them a bad evaluation because they don't like them for whatever protected status or um, make false claims about their performance. Uh, and uh, you know, those evaluations go up the chain, let's say, to the HR department, uh, and the supervisor says, well, I recommend we fire this employee, and the HR department says, I'm going to review this, and they conduct an independent review of the, of the situation, and they come to their own conclusion, yes, this person should be fired, let's say, uh, and they go ahead and do that. Uh, the lawyer, the um, legal the defense to that has had been, well, even though the supervisor may have been acting illegally, the HR department conducted an independent investigation free of that uh, discriminatory influence and therefore the company did not have any discriminatory intent when they fired the person, therefore no liability. And the Supreme Court said not so fast, um, you know, let's look at this, <laughs> you know, what's really happening. They said, uh, if the supervisor with the discriminatory intent has an influence in the decision-making process, then we are going to hold the employer liable. And so that, again, has uh, uh, in, you know, increased the potential liability on employers. And then wrap up here, two minutes. Okay. Uh, uh, NLRB, uh, for those of you uh, who have unions, you're probably familiar with it. If you're not, uh, even if you don't have a union, you're covered by the NLRB and likely to be coming to you soon pursuant to a new rule from the NLRB is you're going to likely have to post a notice in the workplace informing all employees of their right uh, to join, organize and join unions and uh, how to do that and how to contact the NLRB if they think their rights are being violated. That's a proposed rule. Uh, it hasn't been issued yet, but it's likely to come down soon. And then, let's see, we'll see. Okay, covered that. And then lastly, um, you can read this in the materials, is um, about a year and a half ago, the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, GINA, went into effect, which prohibits employers from discriminating against employees based on their genetic disposition or genetic characteristics. And the EEOC issued some regulations in December uh, implementing that uh, statute and it governs, uh, gives guidance on what, what you can do, what you need to do to protect employees' genetic information and uh, how you can gather that and store it and disseminate it. So uh, you should take a look at that as well. Uh, any questions? Well, I hope I gave you a, an informative update. And now back to, is it back to Woodstock?